The Initiate in the New World, by Cyril Scott. Chapter 12, Questions on Marriage There were two evenings a month on which instead of listening to a set discourse from M.H., the disciples were encouraged to ask questions on any subject that occurred to them. He made a rule, however, that when once a subject was introduced all questions must bear relation to it, this policy being adopted, as he had once explained, I order to ensure consecutiveness of thought. One of the disciples, a Frenchman, who, I was told, had acquired extraordinary physical control, he could hold his breath for a prodigious length of time, stop his heart and perform other remarkable yogic feats, put the question, with a strong foreign accent, say, Master, do you consider marriage compatible with spiritual advancement? That's a very foolish question from you, M. H. replied, the stern inflection of his voice immediately quelling a ripple of subdued amusement. Have you been here all these years to such poor purpose that you don't know the answer without asking me? Then why do the Indian books on yoga tell that it is not, the Frenchman persisted, though he looked uncomfortable after the rebuke. I should have thought you might have known that too, M. H. answered regretfully. How often must I hammer it into your consciousness that you are too lopsided, and that one day you will have to go back and learn all that you have to go back and learn all that you have missed? Answer him, he ordered the Singhalese who was sitting in the front row. The Indian books you speak of, replied the disciple in his usual dispassionate manner, were written by yogis for aspiring yogis. Their teachings are only suitable to European conditions when subjected to a process of selection and adaptation. That is what the gurus are for. As to marriage, it brings bondage to fools and spiritual progress to wise men, it is a playground with many dangers for children and a school for the enlightened. It is that fertile ground on which may be grown the beautiful flowers of a hundred virtues, or the noisome weeds of a hundred vices. Do you consider, one of the women, disciples asked M. H., that people are beginning to understand the spiritual value of marriage? In Europe and America, every trace of sternness had disappeared from his voice, alas, very few people indeed understand its true value. And at present the whole attitude towards matrimony is a disastrous one, which, instead of leading to contentment and spiritual progress, leads to the divorce, court. So long as jealousy is regarded as a reputable passion, and romantic infatuation is considered the chief raison d'etre for entering wedlock, how can we expect it to be otherwise? He paused, waiting for a further question. Do you mean to say, demanded a novelist sitting beside me, that romantic love is never a secure foundation for marriage? Wise men, M. H. replied, are chary of bringing the word never into any argument. Romantic infatuation is very seldom a secure foundation for marriage except in nobles, he added, twinkling. There was a laugh in which the novelist joined. And yet in countries where the laws are easy, M. H. resumed, when people who have married for pleasure on the strength of an infatuation, find themselves unsuited to one another, instead of trying to learn the lesson their egos, higher selves, wish them to learn, they shirk it and, like cowards, run away, to the divorce courts. Because it is too much trouble to adapt themselves, and conquer the dislike and irritation they feel towards each other once the glamour has worn off, they seek the easiest way out of the dilemma. Rather than obey the dictates of the higher self, they listen to the voice of the lower self which says, You thought you loved this man or woman, you've been cheated, so make an end of it and separate forever. But how are you going to prevent people marrying because they're in love? I asked. By gradually setting before them a higher ideal. It will take a long time, but what of that? Teach them to marry neither for passion, pleasure, nor, as goes without saying, for material advantage. What do you mean by passion, somebody inquired, the purely physical? You do well to ask that question, he answered, because the word is often employed in a far too arbitrary sense. Will anybody oblige? I should say there are three forms of passion, I hazarded, one, the purely physical, one, though rare, the purely sentimental, and one, the sentimental, physical. M. H. nodded. And it strikes me, said a very American voice, that what our friend calls the sentimental and the sentimental, physical give the knock, out blow to a man's judgment a daft sight sooner than any sheer unvarnished lust I was ever ashamed of in the days of my youth. 
M.H. broke into a hearty laugh. We are getting along, he observed, any more confessions forthcoming. Every romantic affair I've ever had, said another man, has ended in smoke, so I wouldn't give a damn for one of them. But I can imagine having a very deep and lasting friendship for several women, with any one of whom one could pass a very pleasant night and it's one of those women I'd marry if I wanted to marry at all. Or if I wanted you to marry, M.H. corrected, which is more important. Or you, a sure thing. So you see, though our friend has expressed it in a manner perhaps a little shocking to a Victorian old maid, he has implied that companionship marriage is the only marriage likely to endure. That's all very well, said Viola, but if you tell people to marry simply for friendship, they think you mean a platonic marriage. For what have you a tongue, my child, but to tell people what you do mean? Then you don't approve of platonic marriages? I inferred. If two people who are mentally sympathetic but physically antipathetic wish to marry, that hardly concerns a guru in his, shall I say official capacity. But except in very rare instances, I do not advise enforced platonicism. These platonic marriages which occur nowadays between people belonging to various mystical and occult societies, are symptomatic of a false conception of so, called purity. These good people are trying to progress too fast, and because they are attempting to run with their spiritual feet before they can walk, they are engendering nervous complaints and other evils. The women become hysterical and often suffer from uterine troubles which cloud their judgment and hinder their general activities, and the men suffer from irritability, neurasthenia, and such complaints as occur when there is no guru handy to teach them how to avoid these results. They say to themselves, we are making ourselves purer vehicles for the masters to work through, and the books that they read, full of beautiful sentiments, uphold them in their belief. Some of these well, meaning but misguided people have been monks, nuns or ascetics of a sort in their last lives. Yet why do you suppose in this life they have been born into the noise and turmoil of a European or American civilization? It is in order to learn a different lesson, to learn the particular lesson this civilization, such as it is, has to teach. But if they merely try to repeat their last lesson, so to say, in a different environment, they are wasting their incarnation. I will tell you a little piece of occult news, not so long ago a great yogi lived in India, so much revered was he, that when he was expected in the big towns, the buildings were decorated with flags and the streets with festoons. That, yogi died, and is now reincarnated as a little girl in England. What a, come, down, the unenlightened will say. But no. The ego of that yogi has still something to learn and he can only learn it in a female body and in the Western world, even though he is nearing masterhood. And what's more, if this soul carries out the program the gurus have planned, that erstwhile yogi may marry and have children. And so what I would impress upon you is to help people to learn the lesson their particular environment has to teach. If they are married, they should fulfill all the obligations of marriage, so that they may come to cultivate those virtues which marriage can educe. It is you who must begin to reach mankind the super, morals of marriage. He paused, and a rather shy voice from a pupil who had only recently entered our order asked, and please, what are the super, morals of marriage? Tell him, said M. H. kindly to the Singhalese. Conjugal super, morality is conjugal unselfishness pursued to its logical conclusion, came the answer. Give him a practical example said M. H., if a woman desires a child and her husband is impotent or sterile, he should permit her to have a child by another man, if she so wishes. Good, said M. H., and the new disciple's face was a study. But, objected the Frenchman, if that woman is married with a husband who is sterile, it is her karma. Someone answer him. M. H. ordered sharply. The Singhalese again volunteered, if a woman is drowning in a river, and two men are standing on the bank, one who can swim and one who cannot, shall the man who cannot swim pinion the other man and say, leave her to drown, it is her bad karma. Precisely, said M. H., how can he know that it's not her bad karma merely to get a fright or a ducking or to spoil her newest dress? All the women laughed. Besides, he continued, what about the good karma the other man would make by rescuing her? No, let us teach husbands and wives to leave the workings of karma to the lords of karma. 
The duty of all super, moralists is to act in accordance with the highest principles of unselfishness, and leave the consequences in higher hands. It is these principles, and these only, which can save the marriage, state from the chaotic condition into which it has fallen. Marriage as it is at present exacts too much from human nature on the one hand, and too little on the other. In countries like Italy and Spain it allows a man to behave like a saint. This despotism is hidden under a fig, leaf on which are the words preserving my honor, but it is despotism all the same, and the matrix of brutality, cruelty, and even murder. Preserving my honor means in plainer words preserving my vanity and my selfishness, hence all the tragedies that ensue. Then do you consider conjugal fidelity so unimportant, the new disciple asked, that its breach ought not to be punished? Fidelity, my son, was the gentle rejoinder, is a virtue to be always admired but never exacted. But, somebody was about to interrupt. One moment, my son, I've not finished. There is a form of fidelity which is far more important than sexual fidelity, that is the fidelity of mind and soul. To violate this involves much more serious consequences, because physical links are broken with the death of the body, whereas mental and spiritual links persist into future lives. I gather, said a man named Galay, the oldest of the disciples in point of years, that you think the sexual fidelity which ordinary marriage teaches is not of great value, because it is largely the result of fear I mean of a scandal or a divorce. What sort of lesson would that type of marriage teach in which fidelity was never exacted? Many lessons, my son, but I will only mention one. It's easy enough to be gentle, kind and affectionate to our wives as long as we're in love with them, but it's not so easy when we're in love with somebody else. The man who, although he may be in love with another woman, can still be just the same kind, affectionate husband to his wife, has learned to behave in accordance with that higher fidelity which is one of the lessons free marriage has to teach. After that we broke up for the evening, but as I walked home with one of the disciples I asked, why was M.H. so down on the Frenchman? Because although he's a damn fine nature he just won't absorb the philosophical side of the teaching. And he's got rather a thick hide too, gentle handling makes as little impression on it as a straw on a donkey's back. I laughed. But don't get home with the idea, he continued, that master don't love him as much as any of us. How long has he been in the States? I asked. About fifteen years. Then why hasn't he learnt better English? You can search me, for the same reason he hasn't learnt philosophy, I guess. Chapter 13, Mystification Although I saw the master at the Friday evening lecture I had no private conversation with him. We merely exchanged a few words in the presence of the others, he was going away the following morning and would be absent until Wednesday, but in the interim he hinted that it would please him if I saw a little more of Viola Brind. Was this hint intended to imply that hitherto I had not cultivated her to the extent he could have wished or what? I was becoming more and more mystified. Why always Viola Brind? I even grew conscious of a little imp of the perverse which seemed to whisper, you don't honestly like that girl, although you think you do. She's not the type that really appeals to you, so why not be quite frank about it? If you hadn't been told to cultivate her you'd never have done so of your own accord, and you know it. And I confess that much as I disliked this idea, contrary as it was to my master's wishes, I could not help feeling at times that it was true, though at other times I shook it off and told myself it was absurd and nothing but imagination. Of course I liked the girl, why shouldn't I? There was nothing in her to dislike. Hadn't I been aware that we'd got on splendidly the last time we dined together, then why all of a sudden these misgivings? Surely he wasn't asking much of me, just to become friends with a clever and unusually gifted girl if I couldn't accomplish that, I must indeed be a poor fool. In any case, misgivings or not, I asked Viola to dine with me the very next day and she accepted. Nevertheless when she came I was, to my regret, aware of a slight feeling of hostility towards her. I could not pretend to account for it, but there it was. Just at that moment that second and lower self had evidently got the upper hand. And this was all the more strange, because by nature I am an expansive and affectionate person who seldom feels antagonistic to anybody. 
In fact my large heat has proved an inconvenience rather than otherwise for when I meet people who appeal to me, I am apt to indulge in rather more demonstrativeness than is usually considered the correct thing. Of course I quite made up my mind that I would on no account let Viola notice any change in my attitude towards her, but I did not altogether succeed, for we had been seated only few minutes when she said reflectively, somehow you're not quite yourself too, Knight. I was taken aback for a moment. Do you know, I rejoined, that phrase can be more literally true than is generally supposed. I don't altogether feel myself. Still, I hoped you wouldn't notice it, why? Does it matter, my noticing it? I tried to laugh it off. Oh, it's not of great importance, but, to tell the truth, I'm a little ashamed of it, it makes me feel awkward. I shouldn't worry about it. Do you know what it's like not to feel quite yourself? Don't I just? I immediately became interested. Tell me, you've got psychic powers, have you any idea why, without apparent rhyme or reason, one gets, it's bit difficult to put into words, well, the feeling that one part of oneself is suddenly trying to prevent another part from doing a particular thing, say something quite easy, something one really wants to do. It's hard to tell unless one knows the sort of thing. Yes, I suppose it is, I conceded, not wishing to commit myself any further. Can't you give me an instance, she asked. It's not very easy, you see, it might be something trivial, something that any psycho, analyst could explain, but it might also be something much more formidable, I mean the blacks. What do you mean by the blacks? Don't you know? Surprised underscore, the so, called brothers of the left-hand path. The ones who work against the divine will instead of with it. Oh, those. Of course I know who they are, but I didn't recognize them under that name. Then suddenly I had an impulse to tell her the truth, but was checked by the waitress handing the next course. Look here, I said, when she was out of earshot, we are excellent friends, aren't we? I'm sure I hope so, she smiled. Then if I ask you something rather peculiar, you'll understand. Why, of course. Do you think the blacks, as you call them, might have reasons for wanting to smash up our friendship? I said slowly. It's quite possible, one can never tell what they're up to. But why do you ask? Because something AHS happened. Really, in what way? I hardly like to tell you but I'm going to all the same. I hesitated for a moment, trying to find words that would not seem too crude. I have a feeling, I said at last, as if something were trying to stop me liking you, quite so much. She gave a curious little laugh. That's very peculiar, she said, I have had the same feeling too. You mean that? I mean it, the blacks are obviously trying to get at both of us. But for heaven's sake why? I exclaimed, what's the object of it? Ah, goodness only knows. But I can tell you this much, there's probably something deeper in the whole matter than we know of. When master particularly wishes a thing, it's worth their while to try and stop it. You think it's as important as all that? I suppose it must be. We were again interrupted by the waitress. I'm not usually an inquisitive person, I said when the latter had withdrawn, but upon my soul, I wish I knew what it all meant. Master gave me a hint on Friday to try and see more of you. He said pretty much the same to me. I was more and more mystified. Do you know if he often does this sort of thing, I mean, is he often so keen that two people should, well, be special friends? I've never heard so before, but then one doesn't hear everything. She paused for a moment. I'm up against another mystery, talking of mysteries. I looked at her questioningly. Master says one of these days he may be putting me a test I shan't altogether like. What sort of a test? I asked, intensely interested. That's just what I don't know. He dropped the hint so that I should be prepared. All he said was that it'll be something in the nature of a sacrifice. Good Lord! I exclaimed. Why do you look so surprised? Because, but let's go into the other room. It's usually empty and we can talk better there over our coffee. You were going to tell me something, she said when the coffee and smokes had be brought, 
and she had lit a cigarette. Do you happen to know why I came over here? I asked. To be near master, I suppose. That's one reason, but there's another. He told me he had something in view which would mean making a sacrifice on my part. Don't you think it's rather peculiar that he should say exactly the same thing to both of us? She gave a shrug. Everybody who's with M.H. has to make sacrifices sooner or later, I don't think it necessarily has to do with you and me together. No, I quite admit I don't see how it can. First of all I can't imagine that anything in the way of work we had to do in conjunction could mean such a great sacrifice, secondly, I've forgotten what I wanted to say, now. She laughed, then after a while mused, of course there might be some work he wanted us to do together which was something unpleasant and meant a good deal of self, sacrifice for both of us, but I really can't imagine what sort of work it could be. And that might also be the reason why the blacks are trying to get at us, I suggested. Quite possible. I was silent for a few moments, trying to rack my brains for other solutions, but arrived at none. Suddenly I said, you're clairvoyant, can't you see into the future a bit? She shook her head. I can never see anything to do with myself, clairvoyance never can, at my stage. Besides, besides what? If M.H. intended us to know now, he'd have told us. I felt I had been disloyal to my master, and censured myself. You're quite right, I said, we'd better give up all this speculating and wait and see what happens. In the meantime we've got to prevent these blacks from doing any damage. This talk has done me good. When you first came this evening I felt awkward, and I'll admit it, a bit hostile, but now I'm all right again. Well, that's something to the good, at any rate. After that we talked on other subjects. We also arranged to meet for tea on the Monday. And as that same evening we were to dine with Claire and her mother, and afterwards go to a theatre, we both felt the master would not consider that his wishes had been disregarded. As for Claire and myself, we contrived to see each other nearly every day, and most of our interviews were undisturbed by the presence of a third. Claire had her own little studio, as she called it, and her very accommodating mother showed no surprise that we should spend so much time in each other's company. There was no deception about the matter, Mrs. Delafield knew that our feelings for each other were of the nature of romance, Claire had told her so, and she had accepted the situation on the assumption that her daughter was old enough to think and act for herself. That in so doing she not only called forth my admiration but also my gratitude, goes without saying. I was now passionately in love with Claire, and I knew that my love was reciprocated. It is said that a man of my age is apt to get the divine disease very badly, and I felt this to be true. Moreover it seemed to me this would be my last romance, the last flicker of the romantic fire before I reached that unconditional love, consciousness which M. H. had promised me if, if what. For that was the mystery I still came no nearer to solving. Rather had it seemed to deepen after my conversation with Viola. In any case, should I be able to fulfill his conditions? I did not see how it were possible ever to fall in love again. As M. H. had said, I should lose my heart permanently. But to bring logic to bear on that metaphor, a thing once lost forever cannot be lost a second time. Still, I might of course be wrong. When this permanent love, consciousness did arrive, so to say, it might be so different from what I expected that many a possibility could arise which I had not foreseen. There also came the startling though, suppose the sacrifice I was called upon to make should be so great that I could not face it. It was unlikely, but one can never be absolutely certain of anything except the absolute itself. Still, I banished that doubt almost as soon as it entered my head, I utterly refused to entertain it. Had I not once or twice tasted unconditional love, and, bliss, consciousness, and ever since then known it to be, the pearl of great price, for which one would sell everything else, yes, even the prospect of future romances. Whether it was in answer to my speculations that M. H. treated the whole subject of love in his discourses of the two following Wednesdays, I cannot say. I was at this period never able to gauge to what extent he was conscious of my unspoken thoughts and feelings. All the same he did choose that subject, 
and as nothing momentous happened to me in the intervening week I am placing these two discourses in successive chapters. Chapter 14, Excepts from a Lecture The lecture the Wednesday evening was on Maya and its relation to love, but as much of it was of too intimate a nature to be suitable for publication, I can only give such portions as I consider advisable. M. H. pointed out to begin with that much of what is termed love is purely Maya, that is to say, illusion. And yet illusion is not an adequate translation of Maya, because this word does not mean non, existent or illusory like the objects in a dream, but a condition in which things appear to be as they are not, or in which things appear to be as they are not, or in which we see things as they are not. Thus, much of what is taken for love is Maya, because it is fraught with illusions and engenders illusions in ourselves. The unenlightened and the sentimental, he explained, think love will last forever, but it doesn't, and that is Maya, they think their loved ones age other than they prove to be, and that is Maya. And he went on to show us that a comprehension of this idea is very important, as one of the greatest aids to spiritual progress consists in the attempt to free ourselves from the thraldom of Maya. When we can see all things as they are, instead of as we desire them to be, then we shall have no more disappointments and few more sorrows. We find much of this thraldom of Maya in relation to marriage. The man who thinks he wants to live with a woman for a life, time and finds he doesn't want to live with her for a month is under the thraldom of Maya. The man who thinks a woman will be faithful to him till death, and finds she commits adultery with the first handsome soldier, is under the thraldom of Maya and so on and so forth. We must endeavor to free ourselves from this thraldom, otherwise we shall never gain wisdom or come to no peace. He furthermore maintained that we see much of this maya, element in the prevalent attitude towards sexuality. To give an example. The man who shoots or divorces his wife because she has had sexual intercourse with another man shows at once that he attaches a prodigious importance to sexual intercourse itself, on the other hand, the man who forgives his wife, or, better hand, the man who forgives his wife, or, better still, does not even feel there is anything to forgive, attaches little importance to sexual intercourse itself, and therefore proves himself to be not only a more evolved and enlightened soul but a more chaste one as well. Such a man no longer sees either sexuality or marriage through the veils of Maya. M. H. next spoke of the prevalent misconceptions regarding chastity, purity, and complete abstinence. The chaste man, he explained, is not to our way of thinking here, the man who practices complete sexual continence, but, as its true light. As nobody should be called a gourmand who enjoys his dinner when hungry, yet otherwise attaches little importance to eating, so nobody should be called unchaste who enjoys his sexual act when the body demands it, but otherwise is not preoccupied with sexuality itself. With regard to purity what we mean by the word is not prudery but the exact opposite. Purity is the power to see the beautiful in all things and all functions of life, and to glorify all actions by the spirit of selfishness. He who has learned to be unselfish in every act of his sexual life, is pure. Here followed some instructions which could only prove elevating to mankind, but which prudish conventions do not allow me to publish if only the pure in heart, in the sense of the sexually abstinent, could see God, then every old lady and old gentleman who had outgrown all their passions or never had any, might be in that enviable position. Why should God create in men and women a function by means of which they were to be debarred from seeing Him? Maya again, even texts the unwary interpret through the veils of illusion. The master then passed on to the wrong attitude towards love and passion adopted by some students and teachers of mystical or occult philosophy. You have no right, he declared, to expect unadvanced souls to behave like advanced ones. Though the example is trite, the child in the kindergarten cannot be expected to know or learn the lessons of the sixth from. Nor much you expect even advanced souls to behave like perfect souls, there are only about 300 perfect souls in this world for even advanced souls may not be equally evolved in all directions, there is a little chip out of the crystal somewhere. There is also the type of body to be considered, in which an advanced soul finds itself during a particular incarnation. Take for instance the creative artist, 
very often the finest creative artists appear by their behavior in the domain of sexual morals to be unadvanced souls. And yet they are not, they are merely born with H.A. type of body which is exceedingly difficult to operate and control. When, say, a musician is composing a music, drama or a symphony, tremendous forces from beings perceptible to clairvoyance are playing around and through that man, and the result is a stirring, up of his entire emotional nature. Again, you have to realize that every form of control entails the expenditure of force, and if we consider that nearly all the force which the creative artist has at his disposal must go into his work, there is very little over by means of which to control his sex, nature. But even so, the love, affairs of a great artist, looked at from the standpoint of the masters, who can see, are not quite the same as are those of the ordinary man. Their very transience, which the strict moralist condemns, is symptomatic not of a vacillating soul, but of a soul one, pointed that even love in its erotic sense makes no lasting impression on it. It is only an evolved soul who can fall in love with ten women and not wish to marry any one of them. The great artist knows, be it consciously or subconsciously, that his love, affairs are only Maya illusion, and as soon as anyone realizes that Maya is Maya, he proves himself free from the thraldom of Maya. Those self-righteous ones who exclaim, he's a genius, poor fellow, so I suppose we must forgive him, are neither charitable nor enlightened, only in the heart of the flower of true understanding is hidden the sweet honey of pardon. Thus love, affairs are not evil in themselves, they are only evil when they upset a man's judgment, bring suffering to others or lure us away from the great purpose. This statement, however, he went on to say, was not applicable to souls so advanced as to be nearing masterhood. In the case of these, sexual fidelity to one woman was desirable, because infidelity had a disintegrating effect upon the higher bodies. Here M. H. gave a lengthy occult explanation which would not be intelligible to the uninitiated. He concluded his discourse by saying, The highest type of love may be seen where two people are united in the spirit of perfect freedom, yet neither of them feel the desire to avail themselves of it. But although this may be the highest form of love, it is not of necessity the highest form of marriage. Only when such people marry in order to serve the higher ones in humanity, be it either through work which can only be undertaken conjointly, or by providing suitable bodies for souls wishing to reincarnate through them, only then do they enter upon that type of marriage which is the highest of all, and hence totally beyond the glamorous distortions of Maya illusion.